the King of Glory today, Reverend Pastor Ramal Toon. Amen. Praise the Lord, everybody. It's good to be back. I was telling Mike when he picked me up, I was like, uh, somebody need to tell the bay that it's summer. Because uh, it, was, it was 100 degrees when I left Atlanta, and I didn't bring a jacket. Yeah, y'all laugh because y'all understand. I was like, first move I had to make was to go find me a jacket. Uh, but it is good to be back home. In fact, it's been about seven years uh, since I've been back home. It seems like it was shorter, but I lost two, like all of you, with the pandemic. Uh, and we were joking about this 18 years, 18 years of the way. Praise God. Why don't you give God some praise for 18 years? All of us look like we've been around longer than 18 years, so you know it's hard to do anything for 18 years straight. And a whole lot of life happens in 18 years. I was telling him uh, recently, I was in Washington, D.C., and years ago, over 20 years ago, I served on ministry, in ministry at this church. Now, you know, people who knew you back in the day when they haven't seen you in a while, they still talk to you like it's back in the day because they only know that version of you. And it's interesting because I find that sometimes people always talk about remember when because they don't have access to you now. And I walked in the room and people were talking to me like it was the version of me that they met 20 years ago. And I was like, I don't even remember that dude. I remember him, but I'm not him. And so I said to them, look, it's been 20 years. 20 years ago, we didn't even have an iPhone. We, would any, we were on Blackberries. There was no social media. I said, so I don't really know y'all. So let me just start with, it's good to meet you. Uh, so it is good to be back, but it's good to see many of you. I see a dear friend here uh, who knows me very well. She is excellent at hiding secrets uh, because I still have a career and a job, so I know that she could keep secrets. Uh, it's good to see you, Lisa. Um, but yes, we got. An, I grew up. So Mike mentioned I'm from the I'm from the whole Bay, Hunters Point Mission District, West Oakland, the Crest. I actually finished school in the Crest and Vallejo and then lived in New Jersey. So moved around a lot. Uh, but I still consider the whole Bay home, even though I live in Atlanta. Uh, there is a word, I believe, from the Lord today. So if you would, if you would join me in a word of prayer. God, we come now in the name of Jesus centering ourselves first to honor you. You are the reason we are here. You are the God of our peace, our hopes, our dreams. You are our healer, our redeemer. You are the God of every good and perfect gift. We thank you not just for what you do, Lord, but simply for who you are. You are love, you are truth. We thank you, God, that we never have to defend the truth because you can defend yourself. Holy Spirit, abide with us during this time. Give us, give me, give us what we need. Bless your people. These are your people, and this is your time. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I want to share a little while from the topic, uh, Beauty for Ashes. Uh, and the scripture uh, we are going to read from today is Isaiah chapter 61. Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 61. And we're going to read from verses, verse 1 through verse 4. If you have a say, amen. If you don't say wait. All right. Isaiah 61, verses 1 through 4. I'm going to read it from the NIV version. This is what the word of the Lord says. The spirit of the Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners. He has proclaimed the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, 
to com confront, comfort all who mourn. Let's read that again. To comfort all who mourn and to provide for those who grieve in Zion. This is the verse I want to spend some time on today. To bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. Watch what happens after that. They will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. They will rebuild the ancient ruins and restore the places long devastated. They will renew the, renew the ruined cities that have been devastated for generations. Joy for mourning, praise for despair, beauty for ashes, and then they will rebuild what was ruined and restore places that were devastated. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Now, it's interesting over the last uh, about nine months, I have been traveling around the country and to a few other countries. I've been on this book tour. I've been in Ghana, I've been in Kenya, I've been across the United States. With this book, I wish my dad power of vulnerable conversations between fathers and sons. And in this book, there are the stories of 17 men and their relationships with their fathers around love, affection, and time. And I retell these stories, and then there are healing suggestions from a therapist. And what I've found as I've traveled the country is that people have desire to tell their stories but no one has ever given them permission. Because oftentimes when we share our stories, they're met with judgment, shame, and ridicule. Even in church sometimes our stories are silenced because there is a way we're supposed to look and a way we're supposed to talk in this persona of blessed and highly favored and that we're supposed to cover everything up. And certainly, if you've been through anything, well, just pray about it. But I found that for me and for many of the people in this book and the people I've met around the country, that prayer has been essential, but there's also been this struggle. Perhaps like some of you, I have yearned at times to have this intimate relationship with God to have all that God says that we are meant to have in life, to be blessed and highly favored. As the word says, you'll be blessed when you come and when you go. You'll be the head and not the tail, the top and not the bottom. Your enemies will come in one direction, but flee in seven others. I've wanted all of that. I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope in the future. I, like some of you, have yearned for that. But there was always something in the way Always this uncertainty, does God really mean this for people like me too? People who started at the bottom, people who struggled, people who hustled, people who have a lot of pain on the inside. Does God really want this for me too? And I realized, like so many people I've talked to, that there's this yearning to be closer to God, to receive what God has for you. But something was in the way. And there were these stories of who I was told I could become in the world. These stories and memories of what life used to be like. You'll never amount to anything. People like you don't get to become anything. Look at what you've been through. Look at what your parents have done. And those stories sometimes can haunt you and keep you from what God has for you is not that God doesn't want it for you. Maybe it's because you're still living into a story that was never yours to begin with. I remember going to therapy. I've been in therapy for 10 years now. And my therapist said to me, because I kept making the same mistakes over and over. Every time God did something, I get in my own way. And he said, it's because you're making decisions based on your fractures and not your future. Your environment has changed, but you haven't done the work to change you. And I realized 
that when I looked at this text, God will give you joy for mourning, praise for despair, beauty for ashes. That is an exchange. Joy for your mourning, praise for your despair, beauty for your ashes. The problem is that oftentimes we've been conditioned to think that God, just give me joy on top of my mourning because I don't want to hurt. I don't want to be sad. I don't want to grieve. Just, just give me joy on top of it so that I don't have to deal with it. Give me praise on top of my despair. Give me beauty on top of my ashes. And here's what I've learned, and I think some folk in this room have learned it too. Every time God blesses you and gives you beauty on top of your ashes, you do something to get everything dirty. It's an act of surrender. Surrender the ashes. And here's the thing that I realize we have to do is we have to start asking some questions. And there's some questions I want to share with you that I want you to consider. And if you want, you can take pictures of them on the screen that I want to walk through these questions with you because as individuals and as a body of believers, there's some hard questions sometimes we have to ask ourselves so that each of you can become who you're truly meant to be in the world and so that the church can become what it's truly meant to be in the world. Y'all mind walking through these questions with me? Let's start with the first one. Where, let's see, where are you at? Which ones? You gonna put them on the screen for me? They behind me. Where's the first one? Lord, they behind me, all right. What are the honorable sacrifices that you've made for the sake of ministry that God never asked you for? One of the things I've learned in life as I've traveled the country and even to other countries is that some of us, not just in ministry but in life, have made these honorable sacrifices that mean I have not been available to my family. I have not been available to the people who care for me because I'm giving them the things that they need. I work hard and I'm a provider and I'm not present and we have made the assumption that Putting people to the side and glorifying busy is an ad admirable sacrifice that God will honor. But the problem is God never asked you for that sacrifice. Sometimes we sacrifice people on the altar of busy and on the altar of ministry that God never asked for. God does not require a sacrifice from your home. And if some of us have been are honest with ourselves, we can look back and think about the honorable sacrifices we made, thinking that God would somehow bless us because of the people we did not make time for, not realizing that God actually wants you to live a fully integrated life so that nothing has to be compromised and sacrificed on the altar of busy money or ministry. Second question, what do you need God to redeem in order for you to live a fully integrated life? Over the years of being in ministry, it's been 18 for the way, it's been 23 for me. And one of the things that I learned in church is that the church didn't want all of me in the beginning that there were parts of me, the magna cum laude graduate from Howard University, the honor graduate from Duke University, the military veteran who graduated at the top of his class, the author, the church wanted all of that. But they didn't want the kid from the crest, the kid who hustled at Hunter's Point, the kid who moved and panhandled, whose mom was a substance abuser. They didn't want my wounded places. And what I learned over time is that my wounded places are what the, I really needed the church to help me heal. Yes. Yes. But in order to fit in, I remember one time going to church and it was a Wednesday night, Mike, and it was a testimony service. They said, does anybody have a testimony? I said, I got one. They said, go ahead, to." I said, well... By the time I was in seventh grade, my mom was addicted to drugs and alcohol, and we lost everything, and I lived in my grandparents' house. All of our belongings were in the backyard, and I ended up doing some things in order to survive that I'm not proud of today. But God showed up in my life in spite of all that I went through, and now I'm an honor graduate from two schools, a military veteran. 
And I stopped. And this is what it sounded like. They were like, oh, that, that, that's, that's not what we would call a testimony. The, the Lord healed your body. The, the Lord blessed you with a new car and a new house. You got a new job, but you talking about crackheads and alcohol. And I remember going to the pastor afterwards and telling him what happened. And he said these words I'll never forget. He said, a testimony is good for the soul, but it's bad for the reputation. And I learned to silence parts of my story and put parts of me away, thinking that they were not acceptable to the body of Christ, let alone acceptable to the elitist people who were highly educated and had these great jobs. They didn't want to know the whole truth. And so, like some of you, you threw away parts of you that God never asked you to throw away. And we think sometimes, well, how do I become who I'm meant to be in the world if I bring all of that with me? The thing is, you can use the pain, you just don't let the pain use you. You can use the past, you don't let the past use you. No matter where you go, you're already taking all of you with you anyway. Whether you confront it or not, it's still there. But when you confront it, you can heal it. You cannot conquer what you are not willing to confront. We overcome by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimonies. What parts of your story have you thrown away that God never asked you to throw away in the first place? What do you need to go back and pick up? That you let go of because other people said, don't bring that with you. Had I not went back and picked up my story, there would never have been three books. Had I not gone back and picked up my story, I never would have graduated from college. Because there's some things I learned growing up the way I grew up. It's game recognized game. And my uncle used to tell me sometimes the game stays the same, but the players change. So when I worked on Capitol Hill, I was like, oh, they still hustling. Game's still the same. The players have just changed. I had to go back and redeem parts of the story. What parts of your story do you need to go back and pick up that God never asked you to throw away? Go to the next question, but I want to say something else about this real quick. Sometimes we don't want to go back and pick up the story because we don't want to look at the whole truth. A friend of mine texted me recently, just random question. I don't know what she was really trying to say. I, actually, I do know what she was trying to say, but this was the question. She said, would you date yourself? I said, yeah, I would date me. I like me. And I hit her back, I said, would you date yourself? She said, yeah, of course I would. And then about two minutes later, I got another text. She said, but um, I know the parts of me that someone else might not know. And I texted her back. I said, um, what, so what parts of your shadow self do you think would be a problem for someone else? Because what you're really talking about is the parts of you that other people don't get to see. When you learn to confront your ghost, you will know your ghost and your ghost will set you free. When you're willing to go back and revisit the parts of your story and redeem what they took from you, that's when you can become all of who you are meant to be in the world. What parts of your story do you need to go and revisit and redeem what it took from you? Here's one of the stories that for some of us, you might need to go back and redeem. I was in uh, Winston-Salem, North Carolina, and they were talking about money and innovation. And his brother started talking about small businesses. And he said, some of y'all can start a business selling socks. And I was like, socks? He, he don't understand how money work. And I said, listen, unless you're talking about selling billions of dollars in socks, we're not having the right conversation. I said, the problem for some of us is when we talk about starting businesses and innovation, we're starting small because our understanding of money is so small. And the reason it's so small is because we have a story of scarcity and lack 
that needs our story of who we're truly meant to be needs to be redeemed from that story of scarcity and lack because life was so hard and so difficult because of the absence of money and not having enough that it took from you your right to dream and it took from you your right to have something better than what you have right now but God can redeem everything that was taken from you and that includes your right to dream look at your story of money what did past pain take from you that makes you anxious and afraid to try because God will give you beauty for your ashes. What are your life limiting beliefs that you're carrying and need to release? The belief that you're not enough, that you can't achieve, that you're not going to make it. That those higher levels of life that you desire maybe aren't for people like you. What do you need to redeem from these life-limiting beliefs that do not serve you well? What parts of your story are holding you back? Beliefs that life is hard, that need to be redeemed. A friend of mine said to me recently, he said, you're in a great season of your life. I said, nah, this ain't a season. Because when I approach life through seasons, there's winter coming. I don't do winter. I said, I've decided that my life is an endless summer. <laughs> now, here's the thing about an endless summer. There's still thunderstorms in the summer, but the sun coming back out. So I've decided that I'm no longer going to live into life. And let me tell some of you, stop living through your life with the expectation that at some point life is going so good, but at some point the bottom going to fall out. Yeah. You are holding on to a story that does not serve you well. Why do we tell our stories that trouble's coming, life is too good? It's because we have seen other people for whom life has been good and then something happened. And we have learned to believe that that's going to happen to us, too. I've been on this tour. You can go to the next question. And this Wish My Dad book. And I, you know, somebody said, well, what did you wish your, your daddy would have done differently? And I said, well, you know, I didn't meet my daddy until I was 17. I was raised by my uncles and my grandfather. But here's what I learned through that question. My family raised me through an assumption that my life was going to be like their lives. And the thinking was that if his life is going to be like our lives, then he's going to need the skills that we needed. Because life has taught me that life is hard. You're going to struggle, it's going to be difficult. You're gonna to have to be a fighter. So he's going to need the skills to survive, to fight, and just make it. And I said, I wish my family had a vision for who I could become that was bigger than what they did not become. I wish that they had a vision for who I could become that was bigger than their pain and more focused on my promise. Because then they would have asked themselves, what are the skills that I need to learn in order to help this child become who he's meant to be in the world. What skills do I not have that I need to equip myself with so that I can break the cycle by depositing in the people around me and coming up behind me to break this cycle so that they cannot simply survive, but so that they can thrive. For some of us, the prayer is, God, give me a dream for the people in my life, for the children in my life that's bigger than my pain. Yes. A vision for their future of thriving and not simply surviving. God, give me a vision for the church that's not tied to my church hurt. Wow. The church didn't hurt you. People did. Yes. Someone said to me one day, she said, I said, you got to stop letting your pain use you. You got to use your pain. She said, well, I've been through a lot, and my pain is the reason I do the work that I do in the community. I was like, you sound mad. <laughs> she had a problem with me telling her 
that her pain was not serving her well because what she was really saying was, I need to be angry. And I don't know who I am without this anger. I need this pain because it fuels my anger. So you're telling me to choose a life without my pain. You're asking me to receive beauty for my ashes. I don't know who I would be if I weren't angry. I don't know who I would be without my pain. The thing is, you would still be who you're meant to be, but you will no longer let the pain choose to funk move you in a direction that it wants to move you. You're not letting go of who you are. You're letting go of who you're not. You are not your past, and you are not your pain. The reason we hold on to pain is because we function under this assumption, Mike, that the pain will one day give me peace. That this anger will continue to fuel me and motivate me because I'll show them. Pain never promised you peace. Do you have a toxic relationship with pain? Some of us have been in toxic relationships. I've been in a few myself. And if I'm honest, at one time, I was a toxic person. Until I went to therapy and started realizing it's no longer me, it's them. I just keep picking wrong. So I got more work to do. But this toxic relationship with pain is interesting because it's like a toxic relationship. We start justifying why somebody treats you wrong. Well, they didn't mean to talk to me like that. They didn't mean to treat me that way. One day they're going to change. In essence, what we're saying is one day this person is going to see me and choose to love me the way that I need it. And what you're functioning is is unspoken expectation And just like a toxic relationship with pain, a toxic relationship with another person that is tied to the unspoken expectation that one day they will love you, the problem is they never agreed to live into your unspoken expectation. And then you judge them and resent them for not being something that you never gave voice to and they never had the opportunity to say, yeah, I'm willing to be that or no, I'm not. And just like pain, we make unspoken expectations and the reality is that pain is never going to bring you peace. That person has shown you who they're going to be for you, so it's time to believe them. Pain has shown you what it's going to be for you, so it's time to believe it and then release it. This toxic relationship with pain even shows up in the church. I used to get mad at how the church, but my real, you know the reason I was mad? Because I kicked the church and got mad when the church kicked me back. Sometimes we impose on the body of Christ our own stuff, and then when the body says, no, we're not having it, we get mad at the people around us for raising the standard. Do you have a toxic relationship with pain that needs to be confronted? Next question. We're almost done. That's the last question. What are the ashes that you need to surrender in the presence of God? One day I was in therapy, and I was really going through, it was a dark time, about three years living into Atlanta, and I was struggling. And I called my therapist, and I started explaining to him everything that was going on the absence of close relationships, the loneliness, the isolation, the feeling misunderstood, comparing my life to the life that I wanted. And he asked me, he said, well, what's happening in your life? And I named everything. He said, well, what do you want it to be? And I named everything. And he said, here's the problem. You are never going to be satisfied 
until you learn to express gratitude for where you are. Because until you're satisfied and grateful for what God has already done, whatever God does next is never going to be good enough. Because you'll keep comparing it to some fictitious place that only exists in your mind. And not being grateful for what God has already done. And he said, here's the other thing. You keep talking about everything that's going on around you. But you need to remember who you are. He says, you are a child of God. You are gifted with purpose. You are here to do great things. You are already blessed. He said, that's who you are. And when you finally decide to remember who you are, that's when you will make where you are change. Brothers and sisters, for some of us, you have to remember who you are. Because when you remember who you are in Christ, that's when you will make everything change. One, one more story and I'll let y'all go. My therapist said to me, you know, he said, for some folks, life has been so hard, but life has gotten better. You're not where you were. You are not your past. You are not your pain. He said, but you're holding on to these stories that don't serve you well. You keep talking about what happened to you back then and not being grateful for what's happening right now. Everything you want gives you anxiety because you still have a fear to live. You still talk more about dying than you do about living. You still talk about how hard it was and life ain't that hard no more. He said, you have these memories that you keep holding on to. And he said, you know, it's like holding on to a pair of keys real tight. When you open your hand, what's left? The imprint from the keys. He said, you've been holding on to pain for so long that all you have is the imprint. But when you confront your ghost, when you deal with the source of the pain and you redeem what it took from you, your courage, your confidence, your peace, your joy, when you redeem it from scarcity, from anxiety that's tied to struggle and challenge, you will open up your hand. And he said, you will keep it open. Because when you keep it open, what happens to the imprint? It begins to fade. Beauty for ashes looks like this. Everything you want is on the other side of surrender. We're not taught to surrender. We're taught to fight. But everything God has for you doesn't require a fight. It requires surrender. Surrender takes courage. Beauty for ashes looks like, God, I've been carrying some stuff that I don't want anymore. I've been carrying these things every place you have taken me, and they keep showing up and messing things up. But God, I surrender the negativity in my mind that's tied to the things that people said to me. I surrender the thoughts, Lord, of being reminded of how I was told I wasn't good enough, that I was stupid, that I wasn't going to amount to anything. God, I surrender the abuse, both verbally and even physically sometimes, that I am constantly reminding myself of. God, I surrender all that has happened to me that keeps getting in my way. I surrender my life-limiting beliefs. I'm tired of telling myself what I'm not. I 
surrender my ashes. And Lord, I want the beauty of prosperity. Lord, I want the beauty of joy. Lord, I want the beauty of peace. Lord, I want the beauty of love. And I don't want these ashes anymore because they make me tired. I want to wake up, Lord, full of life and anticipation. I want to express gratitude daily. God, I surrender to receive all that you have for me. The word that God has for you is a word of surrender. There's so much beauty God has for every single one of you that's on the other side of surrender. Stop running from your ghost. They ain't as tough as you think they are. Take back from your pain the peace that it tried to take from you. God has 18 more years of fulfillment for the way that cannot be tied to old stories of what happened back then and cannot be connected to what's happening right now, but gratitude and anticipation of what God is about to do. God cannot move the way without moving you. And as much as we want the way to be a place of healing, you have to become healed yourself. So that when people show up, they see healing in you. So that you're able to point them to the way. There's so much waiting for you. So much joy and peace. So many new levels of ministry that brothers and sisters simply require you letting go of a story that has not been serving you well. Joy for mourning. Praise for despair. Beauty for ashes. If everyone who could stand, stand with me so we can pray. God, we come now in the name of Jesus to give you thanks for your presence. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your freedom. Thank you for your healing, your peace, your joy. For some of us, we've wanted it. But there are these stories that have been getting in our way. We've been telling ourselves life is supposed to be hard and it's going to be struggle. We have anticipated struggle. But we rebuke it right now in the name of Jesus. We take dominion over our stories. Dominion over our pain. Dominion over the anxiety. Dominion over the doubt. And we choose to walk in freedom and in peace. We choose love for our families, for the body of Christ, for this body of believers. We choose to surrender the ashes of an old story to receive new beauty. And we're going to do our own work on ourselves to heal because we've been tired and we don't want to be tired anymore. We've carried stuff that was never ours to begin with. God, we forgive ourselves for holding on to anger. We forgive ourselves for holding on to a story of pain and struggle. We forgive ourselves for waiting on apologies because our healing does not require anyone's apology. 
we're not conceding that power to anybody. We forgive ourselves. God, we thank you for what's next in each person's life, and we thank you for what's next in the life of the way. The story that's yet to be told. And we give you glory for the victories that are coming even right now. Bless your name, God. For every new and perfect gift. Bless your name, God. For what you're going to do in our homes. Bless your name, God, for what you're doing with our children. Bless your name, God, for what you're doing in us right now. We glorify you, God. You are so worthy. We're going to live in expectation of what's next. And we say yes to the beauty. We're letting it in. And we'll give you all the glory, Lord, for how our lives will be changed and for how new souls will be saved. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you the way.